Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20 is our text. I want to read these verses to you and then do a little bit of teaching on it. The Bible says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. These are the two disciples that are uh, told about in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus, to whom Jesus appeared and preached himself from the Old Testament. Verse 14, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the, in the big umbrella of Christianity teach that you must be baptized in order to be saved. And if you're not baptized, then you haven't really completed your salvation. and You might not make it into heaven. I do not believe that's what the Bible is teaching here. In fact, you'll notice it says, he who does not believe will be condemned. It doesn't say he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. It doesn't say those who aren't baptized will be condemned. You will not be condemned if you believe in Jesus. Now, if you do believe in Jesus, you're going to want to be baptized. But baptize, being baptized is not a requirement in order to be saved. Baptism is a step of obedience for those who have been saved. Otherwise, Paul would not have differentiated between the gospel and baptism over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he makes a distinction between the gospel and baptism. If baptism was required to be saved, then it would be part of the gospel message, but it's separate from the gospel message. Verse 17, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. I want to draw your attention to verse 15. Verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's said that St. Francis of Assisi took this so literally that he would, anytime he'd see an animal, he would preach to the animal. He would say, God loves you. God cares you about you. God made you for his glory. I'm paraphrasing, of course. I don't know exactly what he said. But it's said that he would preach to the animals the love of God, the good news of Jesus. I don't think that's what's meant here. The word creature is also used in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation or new creature, some versions say. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Preach to every person. Get the gospel to everyone so that everyone might have the opportunity of knowing and loving Jesus as we do. Go into all the world. If you're not going, then get going. Don't just sit around and wait till Jesus comes back. That's not, that's not what we're to be doing. We're to be spreading the message. We're to be sharing the gospel. Here's the good news. Though you have sinned before holy God, though you deserve the fires of hell, remember, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven because he cares about us. Though we deserve the fires of hell, Christ came to take our place. If we'd repent of our sins and trust in Christ to save us, we'll be saved from the fires of hell. and We'll have an eternity with God in heaven. This is good news that deserves to be heard by everyone, that they can be saved from their sins. You say, well, what if they're not a sinner? <laughs> oh, we're all sinners. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all need to be saved. So we're to take this message to all of the earth. And then throughout history, as God's Christians have been doing that, there have been signs that have followed them. And Jesus lists five signs here that would occur. Supernatural. Number one, 
in my name they will cast out demons. I say this is supernatural. I say this is a sign because we in our own strength cannot cast out demons. Demons are spiritual beings. We don't have power over them ourselves, but we have power over them in Jesus, in his name and with his authority. We can help people be delivered from the power of the enemy. That's sign number one, cast out demons. It's not commanded right here. It's a description, but it is commanded in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8 where he says, cast out demons. He tells his followers, cast out demons. Sign number two, they will speak with new tongues. Again, a, a miracle. It's not learning a language. It's, it's being given by God supernaturally, a language to speak or to pray. They will speak with new tongues. This was fulfilled, of course, in Acts chapter 2. It's made reference to as a gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in chapter 14. And there's, there's real practical guidelines about how this gift of tongues that not everyone will have. It's one of many gifts, but some will have it. And there's practical instruction, instructions about how this gift is to be utilized. And what are the benefits of this gift? It's a sign. It's not commanded here. It's a description of what some Christians will be able to do. Sign number three. They will take up serpents. Now, this is not a spiritual gift. Neither is it commanded anywhere in the Word of God. This is a description of how some Christians will be able to be bit by a snake, a venomous snake, and then survive. It won't hurt them. Think about the Apostle Paul, bit by a venomous snake in the last part of the book of Acts. And the people that lived in that region saw that it was a venomous snake. They were confident he would die because that's what would happen with people who... But it didn't bother him at all. The Lord supernaturally protected him from this snake, this venomous snake. Similar to this sign is sign number four. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. After I preached this message here locally at Harvest Jacksonville, one of our church members came up, approached me and said, we have a friend who was raised in a Muslim country, in a Muslim family, and they converted to Christianity. And oftentimes families don't, take that too well. And this is one of the families, one of those families that didn't take that too well. And so the mother actually sought to poison her daughter to death because she was following Jesus. And she gave her poison unbeknownst to her daughter. Her daughter drank it and it did not kill her. But knowing that she had been poisoned and yet God preserved her life, she took that as a sign. It's time to move on. And so she came to the United States, fled to the United States where she's been able to worship Jesus freely without fear of her parents killing her. This is a description. It's not a command. We're not supposed to take up poison and test our faith or anything like that. But it's a sign of how God supernaturally works in the lives of his people. Sign number five, they will lay, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Are we commanded to do this? Not here, but elsewhere. We are commanded to pray for the sick and to pray for their healing. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God doesn't say yes to the healing. That's a mystery to me. God is sovereign. It's not a magic formula. We can go around healing everyone. But we pray and ask the Lord. We have faith that he can do it if he so desires. But at the end of, at the, end of the day, we have to say, Lord, whatever you will. But it's part of the signs, what would follow God's people as they take the gospel to the ends of the earth. In fact, that is tied into this in verses uh, 19 and 20 that these signs confirm the word that's being delivered. Because here's the deal. No matter what miracles God's people are able to do, or God's able to do through God's people, to protect people from uh, the enemy, to heal the sick, to be protected ourselves from snakes or poison or anything like that, the point is to deliver the message of forgiveness because ultimately we're still going to die. God doesn't preserve our lives forever on this earth. He allows us to die as a part of the judgment on the world of sin. But for those of, her, those of us who are in Christ, we will be raised to new life. We have eternal life. That's the most important thing. What we need most, as we saw back in Mark chapter 2, more than healing physically, more than protection physically, is we need eternal forgiveness of sins. The message that Christ saves. Christ forgives us. God forgives us in Christ as we turn our faith toward Him. This is most important of all. And God will sometimes have signs that confirm this message 
of forgiveness.